Good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Welcome to the very first 10 a.m. service of 2024. If you guys would go ahead and stand with me as we get prepared for the service. If you are here for the very first time, I want to welcome you to Church for the City, where we love to see people far from God find life in Christ. Can somebody say amen? How many of you guys are ready to encounter the Lord this morning? Wow, the 8.30 service was more awake than you guys, I think. So I said, how many guys are ready to encounter the Lord this morning? There we go. There we go. So um, I want to also say welcome to the online campus and the prison campus. We could clap for them too. All right. So we're, there's a verse going to pop up on the screen that I want you guys to read the ver first two words with me, if you would. There it goes. Ready? Fear not. Why? For I am with you. Right? The, the Lord says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not, be, be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold you up with my righteous right hand. Right? So no matter what you're going through in life, fear not. Why? Because he's with us. No matter what's going to happen in this election season, fear not. Why? Because he is with us. Right? Our God is with us. He is the one that's going to hold us up. And in this service today, I just want you to lay all of your fears aside. Not aside, I want you to lay them down and let them go because I want you to encounter the reality and the presence of God this morning. Can somebody say amen? All right, let us pray. Lord, we love you so much and we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house today. We thank you, Lord, that, that you called us and you chose us to be here. Why? Because you want to meet us face to face. I, I pray that we would lay down everything aside. We would allow you to take complete and total control and that you would meet us face to face this morning. Lord, that we would truly encounter you. We give this service up to you and we say have your way with it. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Jesus. 
love Luke with their faith. CTC family, my name is Monica. I started attending CTC in 2022, and I knew then that I wanted to be baptized. Unfortunately, I was not able to due to the fact that I was living with a married man. I lost myself for a while, but I decided to leave my past of sin, sadness, depression, and anxiety behind. I surrendered my life to Jesus, and from that moment on, I asked God to guide me in the right direction. I would not give up on my prayers for God to save me out of this situation. I told myself it was time to get back on my own two feet. In March of 2024, my prayers were answered. As, as I gained my independence back and was able to go to walk away from my 15-year relationship, today I'm standing thanks to the grace of God. These past months have tested my mental emotional and physical health, but I refused to go back to where I was. I had lost myself when I choose to love and live with a married man, but because of God's love and forgiveness, he continued to restore me. As he continues to mend and heal my heart, I want to live for my Lord and walk the path he has for me. I've been coming to CTC for about two years, and now I'm getting, and getting invited here is the best thing that has happened to me has changed my life. Thank you, Pastor Tyrone, for making CTC an exciting place. I know I now look forward every Sunday to come to church and listen to the Word of God. Thank you, CTC, for what, for making a part. <laughs> no, just thank you, CTC, for making me a part of your family and for welcoming me in. Thank you, God, for saving my life. Today, I'm going public with my faith. <laughs> Monica, Jesus said every disciple should be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And because of your confession of faith, today I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And according to scripture, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Come on, church, celebrate. Amen. His will, not ours. Amen, church. His plans are so much better than ours. Let's sing about that this morning. The Lord is my shepherd And He is everything so I will not worry, and I will not fear the enemy. He said that he loves me. He said that he's with me. Even I walk through the valley of shadow and death, and still I know.
Amen. How many know God has good plans for you? I'm telling you, it's wonderful to serve a God that absolutely promises us that goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. And the great joy about that is that it's not just limited here on earth. Psalm 73 promises not only does God have goodness and mercy follow us, but he holds our hand right into glory. It's an eternal promise from our Lord. And if you're holding these elements in your hand, then you understand your place of eternity, that you're not just a person here on earth determined to deal with the stuff on earth and from now until whenever. There's a hope of glory living in you because Christ indeed is your Lord and his plans for you are sure. They're solid. They're good. Cannot be broken. Cannot be shaken. Will not be turned away. There's a good plan for your life. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this opportunity we have to be in your house, in your presence, to commune together with your spirit, but also, Lord, with people of the body. We thank you for the salvation that we have, the promises that we've been given, the certainty and the surety of eternal life that has been made for sure by the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Let's eat together. Let's drink together. Hallelujah. Let's praise our Lord. up across this place. We get
to be praised. Come on, can we exalt the name of the Lord today? We give you our highest praise, Jesus. You are worthy to be praised, forever seated on the throne. Come on, is Jesus seated on the throne of your heart this morning? Come on, he's so good. Well, who's excited to be at the 10 a.m. service this morning? It's a good day to be in the house. Well, hey, we're going to transition to what we call a minute to mingle. That's a time where we get to know the people around us, mingle a little bit before we start the message. All right, good morning to you. Welcome indeed to Church for the City. We're so grateful that you're here uh, with us. We teach the Word of God. We encounter the presence of the Lord. And we share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so grateful that you're part of that journey. We want to give a shout out to the online campus and to the prison campus. Uh, we're thankful for, for them and them uh, being with us. A few things. Uh, I thought I heard it mentioned earlier, but uh, I will say it again. Bridget's gift is an annual thing here. The money is raised for uh, cancer patients. I'm, I think I can say it that way. I know the money stays here locally. Uh, it's usually a big event. Uh, we Love Our City will be staffing some volunteers to help support. So if you, if you are able to do so, I believe the event is October 6th. Um, there should be information at the Connect table also uh, online. Uh, but we want to try to gather those volunteers sometime this week so we know how many we have to help support uh, that event. Also, uh, in the lobby on the way out there, if you have not yet registered to vote, uh, there'll be an opportunity to do that uh, there in the lobby. Uh, Ruth Milney, who has just been so gracious to help us through this, uh, will be there to help you get registered uh, to vote. Now, I want to thank you for your generosity. Every time you come into the building, there's an opportunity to give, as many of you have done. Uh, you can give through the offering boxes. Uh, many of you also have uh, established your giving online, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, those of you that have become new givers, again, uh, what a blessing that that is to us for the continued work uh, that we do and stuff that we do here, of course, here locally and even uh, beyond. I, I want to just share with you, you know, since we have been uh, in, the, in the prison, it has been the prisons, so it's in 35, 34 or 35 states that we're actually uh, in with our services, uh, which is great, which is fantastic. And uh, so we, we get reports uh, every, uh, every week. Just last week, 25,203 uh, tuned in to the services and 49 confessions of faith uh, last week. Just, just awesome, awesome, awesome. So thank you for your generosity and for the work that God is beginning to do. I did get a letter, an e-letter. You know, many of them obviously they have iPads, and I got a letter. Uh, I want to say it was Friday, could have been Thursday, from one of the inmates that's actually at here in Yuma. And uh, said he's been in for two and a half years, found out about our services, and uh, has been watching, committed his life to Christ, and actually is getting out in one week. And so he's looking forward to being here uh, in the house. And so we are grateful, grateful to God for that. All right, I, uh, I want to pray, and then we're going to go ahead and jump right on into uh, the word of the Lord. Father, I want to thank you for this opportunity we have. 
to be in your house or to gather together to worship. We get to do this in spirit and in truth, but we also get to do this in the presence of you and your people. It's a great day to be in your house. It's a great day to serve you. And Lord, I'm trusting that uh, the word, the message that will be delivered today will will have an impact upon all of our lives. Uh, Lord, as we do our best to try to help each of us, as the word has done, to shape our thoughts according to the word of God and biblical values. So I pray for your anointing, your help uh, to guide and lead me through uh, the message. But more so, Lord, may we hear from you. Lord, any words from me that's not of you, let them just fall to the wayside. But every word, Lord God, that comes from you, let us take it in. Let us embrace it. Let it be a a real applicable part uh, of our life. Father, we also pray for every local church in our city. We want every church to grow. We're trusting, Lord, that the gospel is being preached by those that are standing uh, in the pulpit that people are being helped that are far from God, find life in Christ. So we pray for every church in our county. Pray specifically for Pastor Phil Heyman at Valley Baptist, that you would guide him, his family, uh, Lord, the church, uh, their team there, Lord, as they continue to work their part of the venue. Lord, my prayer also obviously goes out to those that are still working through the damages of uh, Hurricane Helene, well over 200 people, Lord, that, have, that are grieving because of a loss, and we know that number can still climb. There's still people, Lord God, that, are, that don't have proper resources. I'm thankful for Convoy of Hope, Samaritan Purse, uh, many, Lord, that are trying to do their very best uh, to work in those parts uh, of, the, of the land. Uh, and, Lord, even a report of maybe another one coming toward Florida. We just pray that that one just be turned away in the name of the Lord Jesus, that these dear people can have a sense of, a sense of relief. Lord, we pray also, Lord, for uh, the continue of the, of the fighting there in the Middle East. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you will just work sovereignly, that this can come to an end, and uh, Lord, lives can be spared. Pray for those that are caught up in the crossfire, Lord, the families that are dealing with loss uh, and grief. Lord, our desire is for peace. We know there won't be ultimate peace on the land until you return. But, Lord, in the meantime, we just pray, Lord, that things can be brokered for peace there and in Russia and and Ukraine. Father, for us here in our city, may we do everything we can to exalt your name, to lift you up, and to glorify you. That we be people, Lord, who love our city. Lord, that we give honor to those that serve us and are city governments, state governments. Lord, that we are just joyful and thankful for those that are first responders in our community, those that support us through police and through fire and border patrol. Uh, Lord, let us be a grateful people. Let us be good citizens. And above all, let us glorify you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, can you stand if you would? Gonna go to one verse and it's in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is in the Old Testament, Psalms, Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes. One verse there. Uh, it reads it in different ways in different translations, but I'm going to just, I'm reading it in the ESV. I think later on it gets posted maybe in New Living. One verse, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse number 2. Here's a wise man that said this, a wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. All right, you can be seated. So this is the third week. Man, I never got so much laughter from the word of God. Beautiful. I love the joy of embracing God's word. (laughs) This is the third week of... um, Jesus in politics, and I, I want to, I'm so grateful actually for the congregation and just your reception and thinking through things and working through things and, you know, many of the, the comments and responses uh, have been good. Those that have been, you know, a little bit on the other side of things, it hasn't affected much. It's actually maybe led to more dialogue and, and conversation. 
Um, but, but, you know, what we know, again, as we go into the uh, election season, that inevitably all of us will be disappointed in some way or manner, even if the one that you may want to lead our country, uh, somewhere down the line, they're going to make some decisions that you won't agree with. That's just, that's just, the, way, that's just the way it goes. Uh, now, personally, as, as, as I think everybody knows, uh, I'm a Christian. I think everybody knows that personally and also uh, a conservative. My first and highest allegiance, of course, is to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, first and foremost. And I, I do believe that every issue that we face nationally, culturally, I, I just believe it's, it's all rooted in spiritual issues. Uh, and I do think that the word of God speaks to every one of those matters. And so I, I do, I have a, I have a care for a, a lot of issues that I think are important, whether it be uh, religious freedom, whether it be uh, pro-family policies that uh, encourage men and women to, to be married and to raise their children uh, in the way of the Lord. I'm very strong about uh, school choice, or at least parents have any opportunity to determine uh, the manner that which their children are educated. Uh, I certainly believe in small government that doesn't encroach upon personal uh, liberties, um, a reduction in national spending, the national debt. Uh, I think what we're doing to our grandchildren is, is just travesty. Certainly believe in security of the borders, uh, for safety for citizens, I support Israel, uh, a commitment to appointing justices that are conservative justices. When I say conservative, I mean those who have a strict view of the Constitution and certainly oppose uh, abortion. Now, uh, regarding the candidates, I also think it's very important uh, that, you, that someone is selected that can actually uh, do the job. When I say do the job, I mean in every sense that has the, the strength, the backbone, to be able to lead the country to deal with all of the foreign issues that may come up, uh, all of the, the things that may challenge us as a nation and challenge us as a, as a people. And so I've stated in this series that you want to look, I encourage you uh, to vote more on policies than, pers than personalities. Uh, the truth is people and their personalities will come and go. Whoever is in position, it's either for four years or eight years at, at the most. But policies that are put in place, those things can remain for quite a while, even though personalities may go. And so I think, admittedly, for Christians, the, 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 the choice that we're given is not so much, not so often, the person that we want, uh, but what is right and good for the country. None of this will be right, of course until Jesus returns. None of this will be right until the Lord comes. And so I said a few weeks ago, in a lot of cases, you just gotta, you just gotta plug your nose and vote and uh, express what you believe is best for the country and not just for you, but we think generationally in everything that we, that we do. There's a passage in Ezekiel, and I think this one will be on the screen, Ezekiel 33, one through five. It says, once again, a message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, give your people this message. When I bring an army against a country, the people of that land choose one of their own to be a watchman. When the watchman sees the enemy coming, he sounds the alarm to warn the people. Then if those who hear the alarm refuse to take action, it is their own fault if they die. They heard the alarm but ignored it. So the responsibility is theirs. If they had listened to the warning, they could have saved their lives. And I firmly believe that my role, uh, not only commissioned by God, but supported by you, is to preach and teach the gospel, to lay out what is right. This particular passage doesn't really necessarily refer to a political warning in nature. It's just talking about those who are appointed watchmen to be able to declare what is right and what is true, and for people to embrace that. And so the emphasis that he's making is the concern that people should have to, to hear uh, a clear warning and, and to respond 
rightly in that. And so I, I think it's a principle that should apply in all things, in everything that we do. Since we are kingdom people, uh, we're Jesus people, we're word people, I think we should always hear what is right and respond rightly to it for the sake uh, of our life. And so with that, of course, the reminder again is that this is, this is not a coronation, it's, it's, it's an election. No one can save us from evil and bad actors. We're going to have those as long as we're on the scene. Our hope is only in Jesus Christ alone. That's where we put our ultimate hope. But the church does have a role. The church has a responsibility in the process to be salt and to be light. And so we've been emphasizing that it's right for us to be engaged politically in whatever manner that you think that is good and to love uh, our neighbors. We love our neighbors and the decisions that we make that's good for the land, that we're ambassadors of Christ. We advocate for good. We do that by praying. We do that by voting. We do that by many running for, for office. If, if we don't, there's, there's a vacuum. And whenever there's a vacuum of what is not good in the gap, then evil fills in. It, it's a fact, and this is certainly a statement by Gary Hamrick that I love. He says, good government can't save us but bad government can destroy us. Good government can't save us. Bad government can destroy us. And so the first thing that I want to share with you is that God uses flawed, sinful people. He uses flawed, sinful people. That's why we say this is not a perfect science. It's not a, it's not a perfect choice. Uh, God used David. David is actually one of my favorite, probably is, my favorite Bible character, he's my favorite, but I would not let David marry one of my daughters. <laughs> the dude is a flawed dude, uh, but God used him. Hezekiah was a good king, and then he made some bad choices on the end, in the end. Samson, again, gifted by God, anointed by God, and then allowed his own lust and desires to get him. But even him, the Lord used at the end. We can talk about Abraham, who was so willing to give up his wife uh, so that he would be protected. And then there's Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus in the Bible who aren't, weren't even God followers, and yet God used them for the people of God. And so when we look at people, we conclude their fall, their, their flaws, I would say, and then sometimes we equate that to a disqualification. But all of us are, are flawed. Nothing we do usually meets 100% criteria. The team I support, teams I like, they don't meet 100 You know the Raiders don't meet no 100% <laughs> criteria. I'm, I'm in mourning almost every Sunday. Virginia got to yank me out of bed on Monday morning. But I mean, so they don't, they don't meet 100% criteria. The school you select doesn't meet 100% criteria. I, I really hate to say this publicly, but not even the church you go to meets 100% criteria. I'm not even sure if the person you married met 100% criteria. I'll just let that settle for just a minute. <laughs> so, that there, so there is no perfection in all things. There's no candidate that has the total package. We're sinful. We're flawed. But we try to find the place of truth. Jesus made this statement in John 18, 37. This is actually the latter part of the verse. He says, in fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. And this is what I like. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Jesus is saying, if you're on the side of truth, you're going to listen to me. And so there are some policies and 
that I think are critical and affects us all. And I, I think this is on the screen, I hope so. We do have a website, it's ctcvotes.com, ctcvotes.com. A lot of work was put into that website uh, that defines policies on both sides, give you instructions for prayer. I encourage you to look at it on there. We do break down uh, the biblical thoughts on abortion, immigration, healthcare, foreign policy, economy, education, crime and policing, and climate change. All of that is dealt with on that. I can't address all of that uh, today, and that's really not my intent. But, but I will tell you the things that, I've, that I look at and approach even, even during this political season, and none of these are in the order of any one degree of importance or another. But what's important to me is the, is the appointment of judges, considering that it's the judges in so many cases that usually have the final decision of how things are carried out in the land. Isaiah 126 says, I will restore your judges as at the first. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. And what the Lord was saying to Isaiah was that there needs to be proper judges that oversee things. And that's throughout the Old Testament, actually. Uh, judges was appointed uh, soon after the people of God got into the promised land. And the judge's responsibility was to judge according to righteousness. They already had the law. They didn't need to make up the law. They didn't need to create the law. And it should be the same with judges that are appointed, whether it be the Supreme Court, federal judges, appellate court, uh, et cetera. None of them are perfect. None of them are going to get it all right. But no decision should be, you know, per personal preferences or, or cultural preference or politically motivated. Judges should be appointed that absolutely follow the law, follow the Constitution, and not use it to weaponization or politi politi politization. And so the question for me is who would do the best on appointing judges? The second thing is border security. God established borders in the Bible. We didn't come up with borders. The United States didn't come up with borders. God established borders. When Israel went into the promised land, he even told the 12 tribes, here is what your borders are. He gave that for each tribe. And also, according to the scripture, as other nations was developed, their borders were given. Acts 17, 26 says God created all the nations throughout the whole earth and he determined their borders. I, I could tell you political stories predominantly, I think, in the book of Judges is where there's more than one, where people went from one location to another and wanted to just enter in to that particular location. When they didn't meet the qualifications, they were, they were told that they couldn't, they couldn't enter in. And so, and a lot of it was because of uh, the ethnic and the, the, the culture and religious practices of the Hebrews. It, 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 if, if they met those, uh, then they could get in. So there's no, there's, the Bible does not tell us not to assimilate immigrants into our country. We have instructions on how to do that. Zechariah 7.10 says, do not oppress the widow or the fatherless. Listen to this, the resident alien or the poor, and do not plot evil in your hearts against one another. But there was a way that they came in. It was a manner that they came in. It was the laws of the land. And for them, the faith of the nation. Now, that's not the case for us, but certainly the laws of the land assimilated themselves into the laws of the land. And so there's a reason that we have a border. There's a reason why there's a process. And every leader, every leader that leads this country has got to be able to identify what their belief is on the border and how to secure it so that we may remain a sovereign nation. The third thing is alliance with Israel. Genesis 12, 3 says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. This was what God's word was to Abram when he called him out of the land of Chaldea and sent him to the promised land and told them that all people would be blessed in him because of him as they followed the faith that he was leading. That hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. 
Now, not everything that Israel does is right and perfect. Not everything that they do. And anything that's done, not done right shouldn't be tolerated. But cozying up to the enemies is very dangerous. God's plan in, in, in includes Israel all the way to the end. I'm just going to remind you again. There's only one nation standing when you get to the end of Revelation. And it's not America. The only nation standing in the end is Israel. So that's why you need to buy some property over there. But it's the only nation standing. And his promise to respect Israel, to honor Israel, still remains the same. The fourth one is religious liberty. Luke chapter 4, verse 8, Jesus said, It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Religious liberty is a part of the foundation of our nation. And when I say religious liberty, I'm not just talking about Christians. There is an honor and respect for all people of religion no matter what they are. And people should not be forced to go against their religious beliefs based on particular policies. Certainly, of course, I certainly can speak to this from the Christian standpoint. Doctors should not be forced to abort children just because they're told they have to do that. It's a violation of religious liberty. The number of cases that we see coming through Alliance Defending Freedom because someone's being taken to court, they have a photography business or they're a baker or whatever the case may be, and they choose not to do one for a gay wedding, and then they're, they're, they're charged with being discrim- discriminating or prejudiced, etc. That violates religious liberty. No way in the world the church should be forced to host a gay wedding. That absolutely goes against religious liberty. And same thing, I just I think that children should be able to opt out of things that when they're in the public school that violates conscience, things that go against their faith. When teachers or whatever the case, librarians bring in drag queens, they should be able to opt out. I can't even believe I just said when they bring in drag queens. But... There we are, religious liberty. Fifth thing is regard to biological sex. Genesis 1:27. so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. There's, there's still only two sexes. I don't care how many options they give you when you're buying an airline ticket or anything else, male, female, unidentified, or whatever all them doggone options is. Sometimes you got to go through a list of four, five, six different things just to say I'm a man. The Bible never, never did say that. It said male or female. That's never changed. And just because someone feels like a woman, it's a good song, but just because somebody feels like a woman, doesn't make them that way. And at the same time, at at the same time, sex changes to redefine and reshape yourself is absolutely against the criteria of God's word. The scripture says that when he made male and female, he looked down upon us and said it was very good. I don't see why you want to tamper with anything God has already said very good. Tamper with it. And any of these laws, these bills that allow for these sex changes and certainly funding, I think, is ridiculous. Uh, You've heard about it, I guess, if you're studying anything, the the bill that Tim Walt signed in April 2023, uh, the so-called gender-affirming care. Actually, they... They dubbed the bill Trans Refuge Bill or something of that, that nature. But what's more disconcerting about that bill is if a child goes to Minnesota because they're living in another state that doesn't allow this, they're protected there in Minnesota even against the rights of their own parents. I'm not making this up. You can read the bill for yourself. Not making this up. 
and it gives the, the state temporary emergency jurisdiction over that child in spite of them having parents, allowing boys to, to become girls and play in sports, I think is a travesty. And can I just be honest? It shouldn't be as a, me as a male speaking against this. Women ought to say something about this. <laughs> women ought to do it. You fought for women's rights all of these years, and then all of a sudden you just want to back down on this issue because you don't want people counseling you or saying things against you. You, you ought to fight for your own daughters. You prepare them all of those years. You invest all that money so that they can do and make it on the volleyball team and get a scholarship, and then they got to go against somebody who's just absolutely more overwhelming than they are. It just, I, I just don't see the sense in it. I, I really don't. Booker T. Washington said this, a lie doesn't become truth. Wrong doesn't become right. And evil doesn't become good just because it's accepted by the majority. It's a great statement, a great statement. Number six is parental rights. Proverbs 22, six instructs parents to train their children the way that they ought to go so that they may continue to grow up. Of course, it's in Colossians. I don't have the verse here, but uh, I wanna say it's chapter three, raise your children in the admonition of the Lord. It's obvious to me that children, parents ought to have the rights over their children, even determining their manner of education. Could dive more into that, but, but I, I, I think you understand stand that. It's certainly God has given parents the rights over their children. The seventh, of course, is the protection of life. Proverbs 6, 16 through 17 says this. There are six things that the Lord hates. No, seven things he detests. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, Hands that kill the innocent. Now, that's only three out of the, uh, the seven. I thought I had both verses here. Sorry about that. But it's good enough. We can stop right there. Hands that kill the innocent. There's no question about it, or shouldn't be no question about it to you, on when a person becomes a person, when a child becomes a child. It's at the moment of conception, obviously, that life is indicated at the moment of conception. But the scripture gives us some clear understanding on the mind of God and the heart of God on his work in the womb of a woman even before the child comes forth. Psalm 139, 13 through 16 says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thanking, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. That's real clear scripturally. On God bringing forth life, God the one that sees life, God's the one that forms life. And the country has moved so left of this. I said it last week and I'll say it again. There, there is not a pro-life candidate in this election, not a one. Uh, President Trump or former President Trump and VP candidate Vance are leaning more toward the left also and establishing somewhere down the line on what they think the number of weeks of a ban should be. And I think a ban on abortion is the wrong term. The term, sh the term really is allowance. You can call it a six-week ban, but what you're saying is, we allow you for six weeks to kill children. You can call it a 15-week ban, but what you're really saying, we allow you for 15 weeks to kill children. That, that's basically what we're, what we're saying. A as you've come in, maybe over the last few weeks, you've probably seen the signs about Proposition 139. And I believe when Ruth is here, she's going to have a list of all of the propositions, and I think they're all worth reading. But 139 is a, is a proposition that we uh, know 
on that proposition is absolutely where, what we support. As it currently stands right now, there's a 15-week allowance for abortion in Arizona. So for people to tell you that there's, there's not an, a, an allowance to, to abort children in Arizona, that's flat out not true. But what Proposition 139 does, it wants to remove the 15-week, uh, what well, they call it a ban. They want to move, remove the 15-week ban and leave it up to an undesignated period of time for the mother's decision and a medical care provider. And a medical care provider doesn't even have to be a doctor. It can be a mental health person. It can be any person who's in the medical field that has authority to give advice. They can say the child is causing you anxiety. They can, they can just come up with anything they want and give reason. Listen, what we have in Arizona is not perfect, but don't make this thing worse. Don't make this thing worse. A no vote on 139 at least keeps it right there where it is at the 15 weeks. And read the language on it. It doesn't even give a stipulation of the age of the person that can have this abortion. Meaning if it's a 16-year-old child, they can clearly go get an abortion based on this law that they're trying to put forth. So don't, when you look at those propositions, please read those things carefully. And I'm encouraging an absolute no vote on Proposition 139. Now, uh, as I get ready to wrap this up, I, I do want to remind you, there's so much more I got here uh, to say, but um, you guys are doing great. I think you, you, you're doing fine. You're doing good. I think you're getting it. So let me, just, let me just remind you. Jesus did not come. Team, you can come. Jesus did not come to help Republicans defeat Democrats, and Jesus didn't come to help Democrats defeat Republicans. Jesus came to inaugurate the kingdom of God, and that's what we belong to. Therefore, we're to vote on biblical lines and not party lines. And so my last statement, again, is on biblical values. Again, I encourage you to look at ctcvotes.com. When it comes to those platforms, look at policies, see how they line up with the kingdom of God. Don't deviate from them on personality and personal preference. There's no perfect platform. It's going to be the lesser of two evils. That's just where it is. But God's truth can be discovered in all of that. You have to go with what you believe is best for the country, not your feelings. It's interesting how sometimes, even in the history of our own nation, we've partnered with those who we don't like to stop evil. In World War II, the United States partnered with Stalin in Russia, partnered with Stalin to stop uh, Hitler and Nazi Germany. There was no love between Stalin and uh, the U.S., but it, there was a need to stop evil. Frederick Douglass said this, I will, I, will, I will unite with anyone to do right but I will not unite with anyone who will do wrong. Anyone who will do wrong. Proverbs 14, 34 says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. So I'm encouraging you to be part of what's right, what's true, what's biblical for the nation, not to make any decisions that's sinful or disgraceful or goes against God's word. Now, ultimately, the greatest decision that you or anybody else needs to make is not who your, who your president is, but who your Lord is. And as we approach this election season, knowing that it's our responsibility to elect a president, don't live this life without having a king. A king in your heart and a king in your life is greater than any president that sits on the throne. And there's only one king that's worthy of that, and that's King Jesus. Everybody stand if you would. Prayer team, you come. We're going to pray. You're going to lead us out in a song. Thank you for being the early crowd. So, you know, uh, what they teach us in uh, preaching school is that 
preaching a sermon is like working eight hours. So I've already put in a full day work. (laughs) But I want to thank you for being the people here who serve this city, who have a heart for the church and have a heart for people beyond you. Let's go out and be salt. Let's go out and be light. Let's make a difference in everything that we do. Do you mind lifting up your hands for just a moment? Father, we lift up our hands as a sign of surrender to you. We know as a people that we're not perfect and we're not going to get everything right. But everything within us says, Lord, we surrender to you. Help us as a people, Lord God, to do right, to be right, to speak right, and to act right. And above all, glorify you. And Father, as we approach the election season, and of course we got whatever, another month or so for that. But above all, Lord God, we pray that we stay firm in our decision for eternity. There's a decision that can be made for the next four to eight years. But Lord, we stand firm in our decision for eternity, that Jesus Christ indeed is our Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Mercy will follow after me Fear will not find me Cause I'll be dwelling in the house of God Surely your goodness and mercy will follow after me Fear will not find me Cause I'll be dwelling in the house of God is good and and that message is a a very rare message to be preached in a church today and pastor used a verse ecclesiastes 10 2 and it says that a a fool i mean a, a a wise person finds the right road and a fool goes down the wrong road well how can we educate ourselves we have ctcvotes.com go there read everything educate yourself and make a wise decision according to the word of God, not according to party lines or how you feel, amen? And when we do that, we're gonna be able to see God receive the glory for what happens, and that's it. And that's all we care about, amen? I I just wanna thank you for coming to our first 10 a.m. service of 2024. We look forward to having you guys back next week. Go in victory, amen?